How about some good economic news for a change? A new examination of the fiscal fortunes of Latin American nations contains just that. Now, when it comes to economic recovery, the financial fortunes of Latin America, yes, Latin America, are providing success stories that most of us can only dream of. While many countries are cutting to the bone, nations like Brazil are beefing up. It's a trend which the IMF has highlighted in their most recent report, and the BBC's Tom Burridge has the details. Latin America famed for its beauty. In recent decades, its finances haven't been so pretty. But the IMF's new report on the region is yet more confirmation that things are changing. It's headlined that Latin American economies are growing faster than expected, and the economies of South America are the biggest winners. In Brazil, Peru and Uruguay, GDP growth this year is expected to exceed 7%. Chile's economy has recovered after this year's earthquake, and Colombia's growth is also steady. So why is South America enjoying relatively high levels of growth so soon after the global downturn? It's partly down to the growth of domestic industries, like cars that are built in Brazil and bought in Brazil. The fact that South American countries have developed their own industries to maintain and strengthen growth in the future is one of the most significant findings of this report. But the IMF warns that domestic consumption and investment need to grow at a sustainable pace. Take the marathon approach rather than the sprint, they say. The other main factor is South American exports to emerging Asian economies like China. Take Chile. It exports huge amounts of copper to China. Commodity prices are relatively high and are predicted to remain so. This means South American economies are less dependent on the United States, where growth is slow. The same cannot be said for the economies of countries in the Caribbean. They're highly dependent on tourism from the United States and Europe, and so growth there is slow. In Central America, growth is faster than in the Caribbean, but slower than in most of South America. Once again, Central America is struggling, because of its strong links to a relatively sluggish U.S. economy. Tom Burridge, BBC News. Well, for more on the successful path of Latin America's charted, I spoke with Rodrigo Valdez, the IMF's Deputy Director of the Western Hemisphere Department. Rodrigo Valdez, thanks for coming on the program. I, I mean, how things have changed is the kind of initial reaction, isn't it? I mean, 20 years ago, we thought of something completely different when we mentioned Latin America and its economies. Why have things changed so much and how big is this change? Thank you for having me first. And I would say that the big, big change is Latin America le learned in the past that crises are very costly and there was, therefore was very prudent in the run-up. So before all the problems of 2009, uh, the economies were pretty lean. They were not in, in, in excess. And therefore, once uh, bad uh, things ha happened in the, in, in the world, they were really ready to rebound very quickly. The critical thing is that uh, macroeconomic policy were prudent. Right, so they learned from their mistakes. Absolutely, and the mistakes were very big in the past, so we have plenty exp of experience of that in Latin America. Now, we've talked a lot about Brazil being a real engine of growth. Is the kind of economic phenomenon that we see in Brazil um, spread across the region, or is Brazil the exception? Well, the region actually has two phases. It has the South American phase, which is growing very fast, and you have many countries like Brazil, Colombia, Chile, Peru, Uruguay, Paraguay, growing very fast but also Central America and the Caribbean, which are having their own difficulties. Basically, South America export commodities, and the commodity prices are pretty high, thanks for, of chi for China. And at the same time, uh, they are very integrated financially, so low interest rates in the world help these economies. Central America has other problems. It's very tied to the US. Uh, the Caribbean, for example, depends a lot on tourism, and tourism flows are still very subdued. But South America, for sure, is a more generalized thing than just Brazil. And crucially, this is not just, um, we're not just talking about economies here that are geared towards export. I mean, Brazil and Argentina consume the stuff that they produce. These are internally led uh, engines of growth. Yeah, the economies are in general pretty open. Brazil is a bit more closed. But the important thing for this cycle, this rebound, this fast growth, is that domestic demand is picking up. It's not exports, what is really, really drying this. Uh, it is domestic demand that is uh, going really fast, thanks to commodity prices and thanks also to policies that are stimulative in this moment. 
So we're seeing emerging middle classes in places like Brazil. Um, so the political consequences of this economic growth are also going to be felt, aren't they? Oh, absolutely. But it's also a double sword edge in terms that you have to manage very careful the good times. Uh, remember, excess are at the end bad because you pay back this excess in the future. So the big challenge for the, for the region is to run these good times, but that these good times are not too good in terms that you have a party that you end up badly. And briefly, uh, Rodrigo, does the United States lose out when Latin America is doing well, or does it gain from it as well? Actually, on the contrary, uh, in this, this time around, Latin America is helping the U.S. Uh, in terms that they are importing from elsewhere, not only the U.S., the world economy. Uh, they are doing their fair share in terms of pulling the rest out of... of Things out really of have effect. changed. <laughs> uh, the, what is true is that Latin America is, is relatively small, so it cannot do it by itself. We need all regions to, to cooperate on this. Rodrigo Valdez, thank you very much. Thank you. As part of our modern migrant season, the other America. Something needs explaining about Latin America. Why has a continent with so many resources underperformed in the global economy over the last century? Why has it been described as the lost continent? And how is it that more than 350 million of its citizens have been defined by the United Nations as not able to meet their basic human needs? At significant points in the past, Latin America has kept itself from global business, isolated itself from the world. In the past 20 years, it has again embraced globalization. If you have widespread poverty in a middle-income country, then that means that a lot of people are not actually taking part in the economy in an active way. Corporations are and will always be the key drivers of employment in society. The private sector is the key driver of economic growth. And as such, they must be part of the solution. So when it comes to raising the poor from two to eight dollars a day, does big business hold the biggest lever? It's not a view that finds sympathy in conventional development thinking. No one of the actors in development uh, could be able to provide a solution to, to poverty and inequalities in, in this region and, and all over the world. Uh, the, the private sector should be very responsible. They cannot uh, behave in the same way they have been doing in Latin America in, in, the, in the last centuries. Uh, they should make a transformation by themselves. Economies, like football teams, work better when everyone plays to their maximum potential. In economic terms, Jose and his family were spectators. They grew bananas, but on a small scale, subsistence level on their own. Now they're part of a team, an association that packs for a company selling bananas around the world. It's not made them or their community rich, but it has started a process that's moving them out of poverty towards a decent living. Jose and his sons now carefully manage their plantation to get the best from their crop. They were approached by the multinational fruit company, Dole. We had some talks and some training at Dole that Dole were offering us, where they talked to us about the program, and we didn't really believe them. Of the 150 farmers that came to the talks, just seven of us decided to enter the program. Those who took up the offer were organized into associations, and new standards were set out. In the beginning, we learned new techniques in the care of the bananas. It was different to what we had done before. The first year, we did not see much profit because of all the waste. 
After a year, we noticed that the more care we took of the bananas, the more profit we made, because there were fewer spoiled bananas. In return, the growers were introduced to new markets, markets that could pay a premium for the quality they could now produce. We are assessing all the time the prices, and I, I would say that the price that we are that the grower are getting right now, multiplied by the production, it's about three times the minimum salary that the government implement here in Peru. When they came to us to offer us access to the European market, we were very happy. Because as farmers, they gave us the opportunity to export to other countries. We didn't know which countries. It's clear that life has improved for the growers. But what's in it for the company? It was at the beginning, so the production came up uh, three times. It was around 400 boxes per hectare per year, and now you have 1.3 boxes per hectare per year. Uh, it's a huge amount, three times the production that the, the grower can get per year. Previously, when I started in the export business, I used to earn 1,200 soles monthly. But now I can earn up to 2200. Let's say, on average, I earn 1500 a month because of the weather. But certainly now I earn a third more. It's profitable now. So the farmer is ahead 30%. On Dole's own figures, they seem to be up 300%. It may be a win win situation, but some winners win more than others. It's a criticism that's been made often on this continent, where there is a residual suspicion that big business naturally behaves like a colonial power. They have such a bad name because there have been one or two cases, or a few cases, um, in which they behaved um, unacceptably. And there have been cases in which uh, multinationals have been uh, involved in environmental uh, despoliation. Um, but I, I think it's important not to generalize from particular cases. But memories are long, and the extraction of commodities, most famously gold and silver in colonial times, and since then, oil, gas, copper and tin, have left their mark. And more than that, twice in the 20th century, multinational companies were complicit in overthrowing elected governments. Big business can be a hard sell here. I think the general record of multinationals in Latin America has been positive. They often bring technology, they often bring a better practice, often than in local companies. They are useful to provide tax revenues and to provide foreign exchange. Um, but you can't really demand much more of them than that. But those two things are very important for the wider process of development. Big business can choose what emerging market to work in. So as such, they can go to the market that offers them the best economics uh, for them to succeed, where they can get the best margins, the lowest cost transactions to give them the most and largest profit margins. Multinationals, because they have that choice, um, haven't always played in the way they could have, in the sense of because they have that choice, they could opt to go somewhere easier, as opposed to somewhere harder. Um, we feel that multinationals can really play a leadership role um, by being emblematic leaders of the inclusive business movement. We know that Dole's business decision to invest in the Banana Association has been beneficial for them. What sort of changes has it brought to the other beneficiaries, like Jose and his family? He 
now keeps his animals where he and his family used to live. It's not the only change. His youngest son goes to school, the first one in the family to do so.